Hi, this is Jarrett, and I'm from the. I'm from Maryland. Well, I'm from North Carolina. I live in Maryland now. I've <laughs> okay. had a few ciders. Uh, I've been drinking cider for. I'm. Let's see. I'm 27 now. I, I'm having to do math on the fly. Uh, I'm uh, about five years now. Five years. Yeah. Okay. Um, That's great. I'm quickly finding that uh, between uh, English styles and sort of uh, newer IPA styles of ciders, uh, those are becoming my favorites. I really like uh, how they have like, a really good fruit forward presentation with very little sh sweetness where it doesn't like overpower the uh, added taste to it. Uh, I think my favorite food to eat while drinking cider, I like food off the grill. So uh, I like burgers and hot dogs and stuff like that. Uh, the, like a, a more acidic fruit taste really helps to cut through the rich savory flavors and let's see I would really like to know more about how you can change some of the base flavors in ciders by changing your fermentation process so how uh, a pelted cider uh, is made different than like a, a traditional English uh, cider um, yeah you are listening to Cider Chat, and this episode is titled Baltimore Speaks Cider. It is episode number 115. Hello and welcome to Cider Chat. My name is Rio Windcaller, and I am the producer and cider MC of this weekly podcast, where we speak with makers, enthusiasts, and folks within the cider trade from around the world. And this week, we have a whole bevy of insight into Baltimore Speaks Cider. A little bit from the cider fans, as you just heard on this opening piece, and we'll also be talking to cider makers from the United States Association of Cider Makers annual conference called CiderCon. I'm going to be giving you a lot of updates, so stay tuned for that. We'll be back in just a moment. Last week, I was in Maryland. I took a road trip from my spot in Ciderville in Massachusetts, and, well, I think I put on nearly a 1,000 miles on my car. So that gives you a little bit of the distance that I was traveling. And I thought this week I would share with you a little bit of an insight on my life and what I do as a podcaster to get these stories to you and to also give you a sense of what happens at CiderCon. If you are thinking about doing this as a commercial cider maker or as one of the many cider enthusiasts I met while at CiderCon. So let's begin on day one. I left on Sunday and headed down to Pennsylvania, figuring that would give me a little bit of a resting point. After spending the night, I was up early on Monday morning and headed to Current Cider. That's based in Percocy, Pennsylvania, and they make their cider there at a brewery called Free Will Brewing, who's a contract brewery and lets the current cider maker, Joe Getz, make some cider. Joe and I spent most of that day sitting by the bar talking and then we headed down into the basement and looked at the barrels. Oh my goodness, down there. That whole area of free will brewing and Percocy, the bottom level of it in the basement is really like the sour room, if you will. There are beers being aged in barrels, giant barrels, and of course, Current has their scene going too. Joe and I were able to sip on some of the cider being aged in a barrel, and I want to tell you, it was some of the most smoothest cider that's of a sour style I have tasted. So you should stay tuned for that, because as they are opening their Fish Town location that's based in Philadelphia, I think they're going to be having some of that cider there. It's kind of like a cidra, but smooth. 
ooh, that's, as a baby's behind, I couldn't believe it. Uh, a lot of viscosity in the, the actual cider itself. Lovely time, and always a big old tip of the hat to Current Cider because they are patrons of Cider Chat in the Cider Going Up campaign. After enjoying some charming chit-chat with Joe, it was time to head out and go down to Maryland. Uh, so he, before I left, he said, Rhea, you want some cider? And I said, sure. I thought he was going to give me a, a four-pack, but the guy reached over and grabbed two cases of cider. One case of the Bees, which is just a delightful, easy-drinking cider. And believe me, I've been drinking it. I'm super stoked to bring that back home and be able to pass that out to folks around here and turn them on the current. And the other one is called Earth, and that's a hop cider. So with two cases of cider in the back seat, I rambled down to Maryland. Only two days into the trip, and I was feeling pretty good. I drive a 2006 car, and right before I left, I had to get the pipes on the transmission replaced because it was just spitting out transmission fluid, and I didn't want that. So I was really happy I got that fixed, and I thought, okay, easy landing over the border in Frederick, Maryland. Well, little did I expect that on my way out to get a little takeout meal that night, the red flashing lights would come up behind me. Yes, I was pulled over by one of Frederick Maryland's finest, a police officer who I like to call Officer Kine. He uh, saw the sign in the back of my seat and asked me, what is CiderCon? which led me to a little conversation about cider, cider being made in both the U.S. and abroad, and all these folks coming to Baltimore. And wouldn't you know it, that just kind of sweetened his heart, and he realized that I was not that person he was in pursuit of who might have been doing a little bit of a backdoor deal at the hotel, and let me go with a recommendation of restaurants next time I am in town. Right about now, you keen listeners might be noticing that we just went from mono to stereo because I am still figuring out the equipment that was given to me by Joby, a fine cider maker and enthusiast and someone who also was able to attend CiderCon. But I'm going off on a tangent. Let's get back to this story. on Tuesday morning about two days before the actual official kickoff of CiderCon to a light dusting of snow on the ground, which I guess folks down there consider a snowstorm. But for someone like me up in my spot of Ciderville, well, we just consider that a light dusting. I was headed to Distillery Lane Ciderworks about 20 minutes out of Fredericks, Maryland. And there I was to speak with the owner, Rob Miller, and cider maker, Tim Rose. I also knew that one of the tours that was doing the pre-conference outing at CiderCon was going to be headed there this morning. And I was hoping to see some of the cider makers. I was there to record an episode with owner Rob Miller and cider maker Tim Rose of Distillery Lane. But wouldn't you know it, standing in the mist with an open bottle of cider, in shorts no less, on one of the most blustery days in January, was none other than Chuck Shelton of Albemarle Cider Works in Virginia. I really recommend listening to his chat number 56. After enjoying a lunch with all the folks on the Cider Tour, it was time to head into Baltimore to CiderCon, my final destination on that trip. But I couldn't leave before Chuck made sure I had some cider to go, and I was able to get a taste of the collaboration made with Abemarle, Distillery Lane Cider Works, and Big Hill Cider in Pennsylvania. It's about an hour and a half ride into Baltimore, and it's really, really pretty all the way. 
That is, of course, until you get into kind of the city sites. But that's always interesting, especially when it's a new city. I landed into Baltimore, was able to see Ellen and Sue, who are key players getting CiderCon set up, got my little name tag, and checked in. That night, I met with Philip Clem, who will be on this podcast. He has Gitchigumi Ciderworks up on the very top, top, like I don't know what they have up there besides snowmobiles, but they have this amazing cidery. We had the most delicious dinner that night finding a restaurant called Ebenezer's Ethiopian Restaurant. We were able to bring in our ciders and had a fantastic conversation. Do look forward to that coming up on Cider Chat. The next morning, it was an early rise because I had a recording set up with Trevor Baker of Noble Cider in North Carolina. They are based right outside of Asheville and are building a tasting room in downtown Asheville. Then right after that, it was a meeting with Marcus Robert of Titan Ciderworks in Yakima, Washington. Both those recordings will be coming up on an upcoming episode of Cider Chat. One of the wonders of being at a large cider conference is you never know who you will meet while there or where you will meet that person. So it just so happened while I was out grabbing a bite to eat, along came Maddie Beeson of Black Twig Cider House in Durham, North Carolina. It was always great seeing him. He gave a wonderful podcast on episode number 70. Do listen to that. Black Twig Cider House is a cider bar, and he had lots of info if you are thinking about doing that or visiting Black Twig in Durham. After gobbling down that burger, I decided to beeline it back to the hotel and conference center to see if I could get a little sneak peek on the U.S. Association of Cider Makers board meeting with the media. I was about an hour late, but nobody gave me any kind of look one way or the other. In fact, I don't think all the board necessarily knows what Cider Chat is, which always kind of leaves me scratching my head. Don't they listen to podcasts? Shoot, all I do is listen to podcasts on how to make my podcast better. So wouldn't it go to figure that if you are on the board of the United States Association of Cider Makers, that you'd be listening to the one cider podcast that is actually publishing every week? Hmm, hmm. Well, that's just the way it rolls sometimes. You just got to kind of keep on promoting it just like cider makers promote their cider. And I get it. You get tired. But come on, folks, already. Get on out there. And and just to be fair, I won't say that all of them didn't know me, but one particular did not. So we'll stay tuned for that in just a little bit into this story. Right after that media meeting with the board members, well, then we were whisked out into the lounge where they were going to have the VIP meetup with media. And that meant all the folks who were going to be pouring during the cider share that means folks are in like little tables and they're from all over the world pouring their ciders well we got to have a little bit of time chit-chatting with them so we're going to go to that next and hear from some of the cider makers that i took a little bit of a snippet of their voices and let me tell you if you're going to cider con this is something you want to make sure you get to because there is nothing like being able to walk around with other like-minded folks who are commercial makers and in the trade to really kind of Chit chat business and also, of course, drink cider. So let's next go to an Ontario cider maker, Heartland Cider in Canada. My name is Brent Clausen. Uh, myself and Val and Kat are uh, down from Heartwood Farm and Cidery, uh, which is just outside of Guelph, Ontario. And uh, we are pouring um, a few different uh, ciders. Uh, our philosophy is to kind of use what we've got. So we, we grow apples, we make maple syrup, we make honey, we grow cayenne peppers, uh, we grow black currants. And so those are basically the, the ingredients that we use uh, in, our, in our ciders. Um, when, when did you start going commercial? Uh, last June. Last June, congratulations. So, Happy been a year. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks. Well, well, let's try some of your cider. Let's try here. some. I hope it's cool enough yet. Uh, we should. It's have okay. This I don't need. I don't need a super chill. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm fine. I, li- so, I like. There is ice. A low temperature. It opens it up. Yeah, yeah. 
So, um, so what we've got, uh, we've got uh, wassail, which is uh, which is a cider that's made steeped on uh, a variety of mulling spices, so cinnamon and cloves. And you want to give that a try? Yeah, it's, it's in the middle of the winter here, so that's exactly what we should start exactly. with. Exactly. Wassail, yes. wassail, yes. wassail, wassail, all over the, wassail, wassail, all over the that's town. That's perfect. There you go. Oh yes, I can smell those spices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kicking out. What's your base cider here? What are you What the, are you using? The base cider, you know, like what what apples are in yeah, it? Yeah. Oh, we've got it's it's a it's a blend. There's a bunch of golden russet. Uh, there's Johnna Gold, Cortland, Northern Spy, Ida Red. Um, and again, we're kind of using apples that grow well in our in our area, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, very yeah. nice. Yeah. Very nice. Well, thank you. And you have the wassail. You have a couple different, yeah. different ones. So, so, uh, so dry maple. This is kind of this is the closest thing to our, our base cider. Uh, so this we, we back sweeten a little bit with uh, with maple syrup. Um, it's an off dry profile. Uh, I should squeeze this one in here too. Eve goes badass. Is uh, is basically our, is our base cider uh, steeped on. Eve goes badass. Eve goes now hang badass. on, folks. Look at this. I want to explain the label to you. It says Eve goes badass. I'm going to keep on saying that a couple times because it's so naughty sounding. Uh, on the background, the label it has like a honeycomb. And there's a little bee on it, and then a little, like a jalapeno pepper. It's a cayenne pepper. Cayenne yeah, yeah. pepper. Yeah, okay, yeah. I don't know my peppers so well. That's right, that's right. I should. It's not necessarily botanically accurate, um, but you get the you get the gist. <laughs> so it's a little bit of um, honey. It's got some zip. And yeah. obviously. Yeah, yeah. It's got a fair bit of bite, and the honey is there just to sort of balance the, uh, balance the, uh, wow. the spice. Yeah. So it's sweet with heat. Ours is more about the other uh, forest. Perfect, and I have a feeling that's exactly who you are to up in Ontario. Well, you know, it, it's funny. We, we made um, Eve for, we made a, a specific batch of this for a fundraiser, and we knew there was going to be a lot of college kids. And so we thought that would be an interesting workshop for doing something that's a little bit outside. Yeah. And they and they loved it, and, and so subsequently we kind of kept on making it. <laughs> Great. So do you want to give a try, give that a try? All right. Absolutely. Oh wow! And she does. Ooh, it's kind of that has helped my nose just clear right yeah, up. Yeah. <laughs> if you've got a cold. I know. Well, I don't. Thank goodness. <laughs> uh, I have avoided that. Knock on wood. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh boy, I could get that. Cayenne yeah. coming off of there. I'm just gonna sniff it and clarify myself here because it's actually a really nice sensation. Yeah, it's, it. I it's, like it actually. It's opening up my my nostril in a way that I kind of need. It's not, you know, it's it's not our it's not our uh, our, our purest cider, right? I mean, the, the other flavors in there are just so they're so bold. Uh, Deceiving there, Brent. It's so like, um, you know, I thought it was gonna be a little bit more hot, but it's not. It's really nicely blended. Yeah, yeah. Well done. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thanks. That's a fun one to make. Mm. Yeah. That's rocking. Really yeah, good. Yeah. We hope cool. people find their way back here and uh, experience what we've got to offer. Yeah. Thank you very much. So who are you with? <laughs> I just had to have the brontosaurus roar at that moment because that last little statement from Brent is kind of classic. Who are you with? What is Cider Chat about? Folks do, still do not know that. That's kind of like going up to a cider maker and saying, What's cider? And uh, is that like soda pop? So I'm not going to blame that board member who didn't really know what Cider Chat is, but just shows you that discoverability is not much different than cider. And here's a great way for you listening right now to help out is to ask your friends, do they know about Cider Chat? And if they don't, show them how to subscribe on their phone. And if you are a cider maker out there commercially with a tasting room, then please do let your patrons know that there's a podcast all about cider, specific to cider and educating people about cider. That would help a lot. In fact, I'm going to be putting up a little PDF online at ciderchat.com that you could download and print out and post on your like little bulletin board that says, listen to Cider Chat, and it shows folks where they could get it. And I, in turn, will continue to talk about cider on this here podcast and let all the listeners out in Ciderville know all the options and possibilities. So when they come knocking on maybe your tasting room door, they'll be walking in with a little bit more information in their back pocket. 
In fact, I think this is a good time to switch gears and hear from some cider fans that I recorded while attending Pour the Core, a cider festival in Baltimore. Hi, this is Charnel, and I'm from North Carolina. I've been drinking cider for about four years, and that's kind of when I started drinking. I didn't like beer, so cider is my beer. Cool. Um, my favorite style of cider, I'll basic apple, like apple cider. Um, I started off with reds. It looks like beer, and so I can drink with everybody else. Um, my favorite food to eat while drinking cider, probably hot wings. Hot wings. Yeah, I love that idea. Um, yeah, North Carolina hot wings. I'm there. <laughs> yep. What I want to know about cider, I guess I'm still trying to uh, find different ones because I'm like, you know, apple cider is kind of, I'm not going to say it's boring, but it's like, I look at I want to try other ciders. And I have been able to try some here, so it's been good. Wonderful. Thank you yep. so much. I, I can't wait to hear what you have to say. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so do I go now? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so I'm Rochelle. I'm from Maryland, Southern Maryland. I'm like two hours away from Baltimore. Um, I've been drinking cider, I don't even know how long. Um, I studied abroad in England, and that's when I like really fell in love with cider when I was like 20, and I've just been drinking it ever since. Like, I love it. Like, I don't drink anything else besides cider. Um, my favorite style of cider is dry. Like, I love dry ciders. Um, but a little sweet every now and then is not is not bad. Um, my favorite food to eat while drinking cider is probably pretty much any like cider goes with anything, so everything. Um, what I want to know about cider is why is it not more available where I live? Like I live in Southern Maryland, and it's not like it hasn't taken over yet. So we're still that? like I know. We're like still like beer country, blah blah. blah but Can you I'm a cider that? fan. Are you able to request yeah. that at your stores? And I do request that? it, and they're like, so it is becoming more popular. But still, like, there's only a couple places that have it on draft. But yeah, so I like go out of my way to find good cider. Awesome. Yeah. Well, we're gonna pass that info around. Thank All right. You. Awesome. Hi, this is Amon, and I'm from Maryland. I've been drinking cider for, gosh, 22 years. <laughs> my favorite style of cider is sweets. My favorite eat, food to eat while drinking cider is, ooh, uh, pork chops. I think pork they go well. Like I think they go well. well. They yeah, do. exactly. Uh, they really do. Yeah. And what I want to know about cider is how long the fermentation process takes. Okay. All right. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. from? Frederick, Maryland. Frederick, Maryland. Okay. Yeah. When I pulled it over the border from Pennsylvania, I got pulled over by the cop in Frederick, Maryland. Uh, but it was a case of mistaken identity. And so we then started talking about <laughs> cider and he said, have a nice day. So he said, first he was going to give me a ticket, but then he saw my sign inside saying that I was coming to Baltimore and going to CiderCon, which is happening. So he just let me go. So, are you all like, I know, so I, I kind of like that area, because uh, the cops know me now. So are you, um, are you all cider drinkers, like, in general? Yeah. Yeah, we can handle the hard stuff. Are, are, you, are you able to find cider in your town, or your city? Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what's yeah. the typical brands that you... Woodchuck. Woodchuck. Yeah. Angry, no, Angry, Angry Orchard. Orchard. And Woodchuck. Woodchuck. Okay. Woodchuck. Crispin. Crispin. Okay, so those are all our cideries. Now, here at Pour the Core, is there something like that you've been trying that you're like, yeah, you know, it tastes really Brown good? Brown Southern. 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 You liking that? So, do you like, do you like the, the sweet ones? Have you tried any hop ciders? There was one that had whiskey in it over here. That was pretty delicious. And like a barrel aged kind of cider? Yeah, that was good. Let me like that? Yep, yeah. okay. <laughs> we got a couple little placards. Okay, cool. And are you hoping that more opportunities, you know, different kinds of varieties might come your way in your town? Absolutely. It's kind of yeah. necessary, there's, right? There's one that's from our town, 
that's right over there Je from Jefferson, Maryland. Uh, it's is the, that Castle Hill? No, uh, Distillery no, Works. Crown Valley was yeah. Oh, oh, Distillery yeah. Lane Cider oh, Works, yeah. yeah. So that was our area. Yeah, yeah, I just recorded a podcast. Are you going to come on the show pretty soon? Well, that's great. Uh, is there, do you know how cider's made? Apples. Apple stars, <laughs> right? <laughs> Do you get fresh pressed apple juice where you live? Can you go to a cider mill and get fresh pressed apple juice? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. So if you let that ferment a little bit inside your refrigerator, you're starting to make cider. Yeah, right on. You know, so it's as easy as that, and then it gets fine tuned. Enjoy the whole experience. I hope that si more cider opportunity comes your way. Hi, this is Ian, and I'm from Maryland. I've been drinking cider for six years. Six years. Yeah. yeah. My uh, my favorite style of cider would be I, I like that really funky cider from uh, the northern region of Spain. Uh, oh, Basque. Yeah, Basque. the Basque. Yeah. Um, so super dry cider. I really like that. Um, and how did you discover that cider? Uh, you know, I think I had it. I was in I was in San Francisco. There's a cider bar there. Uh, up up cider. Up, up cider, yeah, exactly yeah. right. Yeah, that's where I found it. Yeah, awesome. and then I've, I've been to Spain also, but since then. Well, that helps. Yeah. 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 And um, what I want to know about cider? Uh, uh, I don't. I, I know a fair amount. <laughs> So you're pretty good. You just want to keep on finding the different styles and yeah, makers. Yeah, exactly. Find cool. the, perfect, the perfect cider. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Hello. This is Casey, and I'm from Maryland. I've been drinking cider for six years. My favorite style of cider is dry. My favorite food to eat while drinking cider is... Do you normally gravitate towards something when you're having cider or you just drink no, it No, but it's perfect at a, at a summer barbecue, grilling out. That's perfect. fun. Uh, and what I would like to know about cider is what really kick-started the cider movement. Now it's so popular and so big. So I don't know what the turning point was. Awesome. I want to know. This is Megan, and I'm from Indiana. I've been drinking cider for probably a year. My favorite style of cider is a little more sugary. Uh, my favorite food to eat while drinking cider is, hmm, um, probably pizza or something. I don't know. Okay. Um, and what I want to know about cider is how they make it. I'm super interested in the whole process. This is Eric and I'm from Maryland. I've been drinking cider since today, you know, never actually drinking cider. Hi, this is Dylan and I'm from New Jersey. I've been drinking cider for about four years now. Uh, my favorite style of cider is probably something that's pretty tart, uh, fruity. Actually, my favorite would be Ace Pineapple Cider. Uh, my favorite food to eat while drinking cider, that's a tough one. Uh, I'd probably go with um, chicken. I know that sounds weird, but yeah. Uh, and what I want to know about cider is, uh, I guess, more how how they can get it to taste. Like, for example, something like Ace Pineapple, how they get it to taste so perfectly like pineapple in, in an alcoholic drink like that. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Yeah, yeah, that's a, a great query. Perfect, perfect. Thank you. This is Missy, and I am from Maryland. I've been drinking cider for, I don't know, five years maybe. My favorite style of cider is, um, I like blackberry cider that's not too sweet. If it's super sweet, then I don't like it at all, But so there's a, a fine balance. Uh, my favorite food to eat while drinking cider is, hmm... I just like to drink cider. I don't want to eat any food with it. And uh, what I want to know about cider is uh, where to get the best cider. Hi, this is Brian Myers, and I'm from Kansas. Uh, I've been drinking cider 
or 20 plus years. Uh, my favorite style of cider I've recently found out is uh, an IPA cider. I'm really digging that. Uh, the addition of the hops uh, makes a significant difference and uh, tempers the sweetness of the most uh, apples. Uh, my favorite food to eat while drinking cider is... Uh, honestly, I like drinking uh, ciders by themselves, so uh, Sam's food. And uh, what I want to know about cider is cocktails to make with them. A big tip of the glass to Jared, Brent, the group of friends from Fredericks, Maryland, Casey, Ian, Megan, Eric, Dylan, Missy, and Brian. And of course, Pour the Core, which is put on by Starfish Productions for hosting that Cider Fest in the Railroad Museum in Baltimore. Definitely a place to check out. I was walking around on these old locomotives, some that, or at least one, that Abraham Lincoln stood on. That is wicked cool. Now let's head back to the Cider Share that was taking place on Wednesday afternoon at CiderCon and find out a little bit more from some of the commercial makers who are pouring their wares. Hi, I'm Chris with Todd Creek Cider out of Victoria, British Columbia. Great. So and how, uh, when did your cider reopen? Uh, opened uh, four years ago and been working for about six years now on it. So, Great. Yeah. So what, you have some ciders in cans? Yeah, I brought some different stuff for us today because um, everyone makes cider, so I wanted to bring something a little different that isn't very prevalent. So the first one I have is my Island Light, which is actually a blend of my kombucha with wild fermented cider for a 3% alcohol, so you can drink it like all day long sort of thing. Yeah. Um, it's, it is nice and tasty. The other one I have is my Spanish style cider, which is the, uh, with the malolactic fermentation of acetic acid and bacteria doing its thing for that Spanish style sour cider, as we like to say in North America. Perfect. So just a couple different things, so we don't get lost in the masses of everyone just bringing their cider. Those are two different things. Yeah. So we have a little taste of the Island Light. Sure, the Island Light. So Perfect. this is a 3%, and uh, as I mentioned, we make our own kombucha. Okay. And yeah. um, it's green and black tea with some apple juice in it. Then we let the kombucha thing do its thing. And we blend it pretty much 50-50 with our wild fermented cider. The closest side to it is that. And the key is really to just have Light nice and refreshing, tea. really easy drinking. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Wow. And that's what we're looking for. I love your so. labeling. Really Thanks. nice. Thanks. As far as I know, I'm the first person to be doing kombucha and cider. I, as far as I've heard in the world, that's good. How brilliant, because a lot of cider makers came into cider yep. from kombucha. So yeah, that's great. true. So, but it seemed like a really natural fit. Again, like I'm trying to do like a rather for the cider side of things. I kind of see this happening because, you know, grapefruit juice and your apple juice. And there's a, there is a cider maker in BC, a big commercial dude that's making a rattler of cider. So it's like cider with grapefruit juice. And, eh, whatever. Well, um, it, it depends on what you like. It depends totally. on what you like. Because I have to admit, grapefruit's one of my favorite fruits. Mine too. I love grapefruit juice. You're just thinking, but putting uh, it in with cider, it just, it just didn't appeal to me. <laughs> anyway, and the other nice thing is, is we're still dealing with a craft beverage. Like I'm, I'm making the kombucha, so I'm keeping the craft as I'm blending it in with the cider Got itself it. that we craft, right? As Perfect. opposed to just buying a bunch of grapefruit juice and chucking in there. Right. Or right. Or that. So, so that's kind of my thinking behind the kombucha. Keep the craft and the craft cider. Um, with both angles. So the second, that, well, second one that we have, uh, this one will be a little tricky because it's my Spanish style cider. So this one here we're letting you Does see. it need a high pour? It does. So I'll just Oh, look, you're doing that. Look at that. Oh, I'm impressed. Oh, it's upside wow, down. Man. <laughs> I should have kept my other glass there. That's there we go. There we nice. Go. Wow. Okay, and I should drink it quickly. You should. So it's dry, it's still. Ah, dang, that's acid. a good seed it up. But yeah. the one mistake I made with this one is when I made the first uh, this batch, it's a small batch, 150 liter for this one, because it's so unique. I didn't pasteurize it because I wanted it to be as raw wine like uh-huh. as possible. They're, they're but this continues to change its flavor profile in the bottle. Right? So that's one thing. If I would have pasteurized it, you know, even for like a few minutes, I would have like locked in that flavor. So, but it's nice because you know, flavor profile does change for better or worse. I'm not sure, but I don't get that consistency. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's it's still it's a debate, right? Gotcha. Yeah, but it's um, it's a pain in the butt to make. Because you're you're letting your cider do that acetic acid bacteria thing, and you gotta check it all the time. And it could go too far, so you kept you it vinegar. like within the zone. Yeah. Bravo. Yeah. Well, well, thank you very much for lending us a little bit of what you're doing in British Columbia, which is a beautiful part of the world. Thanks very much, Ria. Appreciate it. Thank you. 
Jerry, you are Brian Sider, based in where in Virginia? Uh, Nelson County, Virginia. Nelson County, Nelson. what, east, west? Uh, um, it's pretty central, a little central, bit west. Okay, all right. Near Charlottesville. So here you are at CiderCon pouring your ciders. They yeah. have no labels. No labels. So you're under no under the hood right now. Under the hood. I officially got licensed about a week and a half ago. Congratulations. So, That's huge. So yeah, these are yeah. like samples I've made over the past you okay. know, six months. And so what can people expect from your ciders? What are you, what are you looking at for your cidery? Uh, it's tough. So more, you know, handcrafted, authentic, more country style ciders. So not going with super clear. I want to get some different flavors. And just really go for a more craft and aim for, you know, not a standard, you know, generic cider. So not a really very high end, like a half mile cider works or a, okay. you know, a wine. Right. And not really a, you know, mass produced beer cider. Okay, so. that's fair enough, kind of middle ground. Right so are you orchard base or are you bringing in juice or are you picking um, apples? Right now I'm bringing in juice okay. from my orchard. So it is picked on my orchard. Whoa. Take it away, and then I buy it back. Um, but yeah, so I, I they take out. you. You yeah. have an orchard. They take the so, fruit away. Yeah, so my okay. orchard's leached at least out. So I buy my apples from the guys at least my orchard. Wow, how big of an orchard are we talking about? About 40 acres. Holy smokes! So, this is a family orchard. It's, it's just me now. So wow. this is like I'm working my way out of corporate life to okay, okay, be a farmer and make cider. Wow, well, so. good for you. May, may I have a taste of your cider? Yeah, absolutely. So this is a spiced, uh, more of a pie spice, 2% residual sugars. Perfect. You said spice? Mm-hmm. So, you know, cinnamon, some nutmeg. This one I want with a little bit of clove. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Very nice. You like it? Yeah, I do. And, uh, all those spices just kind of drop down individually, which is nice. Yeah. Yeah. It, <laughs> so you're making a primary base cider and then adding from there. Correct. So I'll okay. do a, you know, do a base, a secondary fermentation, and then modify a little bit. Cool. You know, right now they're not bottle conditioned. I think ultimately right. I want everything to be bottle conditioned, but it's... Are, are you going to have a tasting room or are you primarily production and going up? going to be a tasting room, like, so that's kind of phase two. So get this going, have a product that actually is decent and develop a brand and then, yeah, do a, a small tasting room and eventually I live in Richmond, so have a kind of a separate tasting room in Richmond Got and it. just get it there also. Great. But, we are trying to keep it small, so not distribution, no distribution, like yeah. self-distributed farm wineries. Well, you're, you're stepping into it, so sometimes yeah. people go running in like a bull, or sometimes people, you know, take it a very methodical yeah. approach. Both so, are... I can do it without taking on debt. That you know, is a good thing. No debt, no equity, so... That's right, that's worst right. Worst case, good. you know... No more fun cars. Good. Well, best of luck. And it's Brian Sider yep. in Virginia. In what county? Nelson County. Nelson County. All right. Thank yep. you. Thank you. Um, this is, my name is Doc, Doc Cheskin. Um, I'm one of the owners and brewmaster at uh, Liquid Alchemy Beverages in Wilmington, Delaware. So you're a brewmaster, but you're making mead and cider. So yes, how, I how am. are you a brewmaster versus a, a maker? Because it a sounds like maker. you're brewing. Well, you know what? I, I've <laughs> stumbled on both of these alcoholic specialties kind of by accident, um, kind of home brewing gone crazy. I originally started making um, meats. I got good at it. I got, uh, I guess, uh, semi bored one year when uh, apples were in season, and I started to kind of play with ciders. It took a while because I tried a very hard style of cider to play with. But I eventually figured out how to make a really good mahogany cider, and now we actually mahogany call mahogany cider. Do you yes. have a mahogany cider here? It is no, no. Well, actually, you know what? I actually have some. I brought some of my room. I mean, we, I brought some. We're gonna have a little session we'll later that, on. We'll get that later. Okay. It literally right. is as dark as. What does that, that mean, mahogany cider? Is that it's like that color? Kind of, uh, that is the color it is. It's that dark. Wow. Okay. So I mean, most ciders are very amber colored. Yeah. This literally is a mahogany color. All right. Right. So um, you have some meads here. Uh, well, actually, these, these, these are ciders. ciders. They're all ciders. Okay. It's, these are still ciders, so they're not carbonated. They're unfiltered, and they're just made with Delaware products. All right. So can can, can, can I with, try some? Yep, Let's try some is, so we could talk, because I'm a little parched here. 
Delaware apples. That's perfect. Delaware honey. Delaware water. Delaware made. And very, very smooth for 9.3%. Holy smokes. Yes. But you're not and brewing that. You're fermenting that. Are you boiling that well, or anything? Brewing is a general category. You know, oh, everything man, from you're a cider fermentation, cup. there's... there's Basically, all of the um, ciders that we we make, except for our very simple ones, are a two-step process. So there's a primary fermentation, and secondary fermentation. So, and you know, I'll, I'll kind of throw that into the brewing category. Um, so yeah, it's technically not a beer, but but it's also think, in the wine category too, and they don't brew. So I'm I'm I'm, well, I'm harassing you a little bit. What is the wine? What is the wine like? If there was like a winemaker, he would just say, "I'm making wine." No, he's or, a winemaker. Okay, and he ferments. But what would be the process that he would say? He ferments. Yeah. He doesn't brew wine. Well, that's because winemakers are too stuffy. Because they, winemakers are what? They're, they're so stuffy that they, they just want to say that they're winemakers and they Spoke, put their they put their like pinky they put their right. pinky up in the air. <laughs> yeah. We're we're we'll somewhere agree to disagree. we're somewhere between um, <laughs> we're in the craft wine or in the craft exactly. craft craft, uh, craft ciders. Right. Okay. Uh, we're very much inspired inspired by dogfish head and yards and victory. All right. And yeah, and, which is based in so, uh, Delaware. Yep. We try to make some Great. of the funkier styles. Good. So you that was really lovely. Nine percent, very smooth. Are all your ciders all Delaware-based product? No. Um, actually, our primary source of apples are Pennsylvania. Um, we just we happen to be very lucky. We're very have a lot. We're we're much in the north side of the state. Yeah. So we're very close to Pennsylvania. We're only a couple miles away, and we've got some of the best orchards in the country within about 50 miles of us. So we're very very lucky, and we've got a source that is just brilliant. That Great. that's where we make most of our stuff. But this is part of a special edition, and we wanted to bring it here just because we know that everybody was going to be. I don't know, tasting a lot of the more conservative flavor, so we wanted to bring something that was a little more off the wall and, and basically kind of bordering on an apple wine. Well, was, well that, that is a nice cider that you have there, and uh, you could call yourself an alchemist, too. We are an alchemist, yes. There you go. So that would kind of like fit So maybe it. that's it. Maybe I'm not a brewer, but an alchemist. Yeah. Maybe that's better. Well, cheers. Thank cheers. you so much. Cheers. cheers. We'll just go there. and Very nice talking to you. A big tip of the glass to Brent from Heartland Cider in Ontario, Canada, Chris from Todd Creek Craft Cider in British Columbia, Jerry from Bryant Cider, a new cidery startup in Nelson, Virginia, or Nelson County, and Doc, who is with Liquid Alchemy in Delaware. I have to say, Doc, I never did get a taste of that mahogany. I sure would. That would be pretty interesting. And then we'll get to see how you're alchemist style actually works you know that conversation about brewing and fermenting and winemaking it's one you have to have and uh you know i see the guy's point of view he came in as a brewer i could relate to that the first thing i started doing was making beer i was a home brewer but as time goes on just to kind of keep things clarified for the consumer it's good to make sure that we know where we stand in the world so we don't get it too confusing. That might work for you, but I think the consumer can get confused. Um, But maybe in the end, all they really care about is what's in their glass. I don't know. The jury's still out. We're going to come back, and I'm going to bring you up to snuff with some of the final recap of CiderCon in Baltimore 2018. Thursday is really the opening of CiderCon. It's a two-day conference in essence, even though there are some pre-conference events, much like most conferences, right? And it kicks off at 8.30 in the morning, bright and shiny. And there was a presentation by Danny Brager of the Nielsen Group, which I have the PowerPoint to and a recording. So stay tuned for that. I will be putting that out also on the Cider Chat YouTube channel. After that, I was headed to a chat and a recording with Paul Vanderheide of Vandermill Ciders in Michigan. This is a cidery that has two locations now, and it was a very informative chat. And I was quite happy that Paul finally realized that it was worth his time to sit still and go through this recording. Uh, Originally, he was going to cut out in the middle just to go and introduce Ryan Burke of Angry Orchard. And you know, truthfully, Ryan doesn't really need too much of an uh, introduction. He could handle that himself. 
I think once Paul got a sense of what Cider Chat was, he got in his mind that actually this might be worth his while. And I super appreciate the bottle of his heritage cider called Chapman. I appreciate that because if you're a cider maker looking to be on the podcast, I really dig your modern ciders. Those are really cool. Uh, Having made blueberry ciders and banana ciders and ginger ciders myself. But to do uh, just a straightforward apple cider, well, one thing, it showcases your cider making skills. And I imagine it's really the reason why you got into cider making in the first place. So thank you again, Paul. That podcast with Vandermill Cider will be coming out in a bit, so stay tuned for that. After my chat with Paul, then it was on to record and videotape the presentation by John Edwards, who also happens to be a patron of Cider Chat and a super-duper whiz. John was fairly jet-lagged, having flown in from Japan, but he put on a presentation on chemical fingerprints of cider, basically breaking down all the chemical components that you would find in a cider. And he's doing this analysis, and, you know, I kind of followed it. Not to mention, I had my handy-dandy camera there following his pointer along. So hopefully that will then deliver as a nice presentation for you Look for it on the Cider Chat YouTube channel, along with a presentation by Rebecca de Kramer of Scott's Lab. She did a fantastic presentation also on off odors and talking about sulfur. And of course, Scott's Lab is all about selling yeast and really helping cider makers. Oh, handy dandy presentation. I also have her PowerPoint and a recording. So stay tuned for that on the Cider Chat YouTube channel. Let me catch a little breath here, and then I'll tell you about the rest of my evening, because believe me, that day had just begun. That evening, I was set to have dinner with Matt DeLong of Rich Cider Company in Michigan. However, I had to bag that due to a obligation where I had to, well, do a family conference call. You see, I got a senior mom, and sometimes that takes conference calls to deal with. But Matt was kind enough to meet with me and forego the dinner. Wonderful time with him. Learned a lot about this new cidery out on the ridge in Michigan, so stay tuned for that. But, you know, I was still pretty hungry, and wouldn't you know it, back down in the lodge, I met... Harlow Hine from Ramborn Cider Company in Luxembourg. Now, if you're a regular listener of this podcast, you, like me, both know that Ramborn is part of the Cider Going Up campaign, specific to commercial cider makers who want to donate a little bit more to help keep this podcast thriving. Well, luck had it that we kind of walked into each other and it's like, are you kidding me? And it turned out that, uh, no, he was not. He was there in, in like heart and soul and just the person I wanted to talk to. So that evening I did have dinner with a cider maker and it turned out to be Carlo. What an amazing conversation and finding out about this cidery that is the only cidery in the country of Luxembourg. It is one heck of a a scene there. So stay tuned for that podcast. It was fantastic. Well, again, the night didn't end there. After kind of settling down, after that amazing dinner and charming chit-chat, I decided it was time to take a little bit of me time. So I went up into my hotel room and grabbed my four-foot staff and brought it down onto the fourth-floor lobby, a little backroom area, kind of near the elevators, but with a wide open space, because I need to work out a little bit. You see, I practice and teach Aikido, which is a Japanese martial art, and I've been finding that moving with a four-foot staff and swirling that around really helps loosen up my shoulders, and I have one shoulder that is recovering from rotator cuff surgery. You know, I still can't put my arm out straight without my hand shaking holding a cup of cider. And I'll be darned if I'm going to not be able to do that in short order. So I'm working pretty pretty hard at that. And I I took the time to like just spin around. In fact, there's going to be a little YouTube video going right up this week doing a synopsis of all the folks I met. 
and there'll be a little clip of the Aikido, because I sure love it, and uh, I love sharing that too. In fact, I'm thinking next year at CiderCon, wouldn't it be nice to have cider and yoga, people who want to gather doing that? And maybe, I don't know, maybe I could figure out something with cider and Aikido. Uh, Anyways, I digress. I worked out for a while and went back down to the lounge on my way up to the room and just happened to see somebody I was hoping to meet the whole time while I was there. And that was Erica Jetter who is a cider enthusiast, and she was volunteering at CiderCon. So if you've been on any kind of social media for a while, you would have heard of Erica. Uh, So let me go to a little clip that I recorded with her, actually on the last day of CiderCon, just to hear a little bit of her voice and what she's doing with her own cider making. So I'm here uh, with Erica Jetter as Michelle McGrath is talking in the background because we're in the furthest table in the back of CiderCon right now, and... Yeah, in case you don't know Erica, which would be really surprising, she is on a lot of the groups on Facebook, a very energetic cider maker, and that energy is really transpired into this amazing cider that we're drinking today called Wild Zambi, and I love that you you are a camper, so you always have this like little Honda, what is that called? What's Honda Element. Honda Element, yeah. What year is your Honda what Element? A, it's a 2006. 2006. It makes it good for going around to be able to drink cider wherever you are, right? Absolutely. You could just pop Road up. Trips, music, cider. Right. I mean, obviously you're somebody who goes and seeks that out, so having that Honda Element... I think Honda should probably have you as like their their <laughs> go-to person. But they stopped making the element. Actually. Damn them! Yeah. So, what can you tell us about this wild Zambi that you did here? Well, um, people people who are music fans from the southeast will recognize that Zambi as a Colonel Bruce Hampton reference, um, big in the jam band scene, kind of the grandfather. And uh, I attended his 70th birthday concert, huge big deal in Atlanta, and he um, left his body during the encore. He he passed on on stage. What a way to go. And I flew back to Richmond. I really didn't sleep that night, Um, but I I was on the tarmac, and I called Albemarle Cider Works and got (laughs) Ann Shelton on the phone, and I said, do you finally have Albemarle Pippin Juice for me? And Mm. the answer was yes. I had been waiting and waiting. So I immediately went and procured the juice and finally got the courage to do a completely wild ferment and let it go. Wow. Um, And it's delicious. It's one of my favorite ciders. I love Albemarle Pippin. So what what year was that made then? This was just... um, they were they were pressed around April, if you can believe it. They had the apples in cold storage at you know, oh, Vintage Virginia wow. Apples. Not even a year old. Um, so they had been, the apples, you know, had been aging and developing. And they pressed them. Beautiful presentation. Um, yeah. We're going to have a photo of you holding your <laughs> stunning bottle. I like that you don't put a label on it because it makes it as somebody who's non-commercial. You don't have to worry about yeah. taking off the label. You just they put make, a little string over it. They make great tag. Then, yeah, you have all the, so you have 7.8% ABV, Evermile, Pippin, Apples, Wild Yeast, Courage, and Time is free. Time, the secret ingredient. Time, and time, it's free. And that's a, not yeah. a Colonel Bruce yeah. reference. How long have you been <laughs> making cider? Um, so only since 2015. And yet, you have come so far, that's an amazing structured cider Thank that you, you have there yeah, I good, would say it's apples. one of the, the better ones I've had at CiderCon mm, thanks for you. so keep it going Thank you. and I have no doubt that Erica will on top of meeting Erica I also met a chap that I didn't really know what he looked like or who he was until I was finally introduced and that is David who happens to be a cider enthusiast and a patron of Cider Chat I got to hang out with those two and a couple more folks, and uh, it was it was special because, you know, you get to go to CiderCon. There's a lot of rock stars there, but it's the folks that are kind of hanging out in the corners or just sweet as apple pie and amazing people, the depth that I really enjoy kind of hanging with and getting to know them. So thank you so much for kindly hanging out with me and being in the elevator that night on Thursday when, unbeknownst to us, a woman walked on and started reading my aura. That was rather 
amazing. I think she needs to go to the Long Island Medium and maybe kind of control some of her her vision because, you know, it kind of she just started blurting out the colors that she saw on me right from there, and uh, I didn't really know what to do with it. But needless <laughs> to say, folks, <laughs> never a dull moment at CiderCon. And that's just Thursday. Friday was amazing, too. I started off the morning by having a chat with Alec Peckham of Peckham Cider in New Zealand. It was the first time I got to speak to a New Zealand cider maker, and, oh, he delivered. Uh, he was going on, or getting ready to leave, and then he said, oh, but I haven't talked about wild yeast yet. And I said, please do. We sat down for even longer. So that chat will be also upcoming. Stay tuned for that. The afternoon of Friday, I was able to meet with one of my heroes, Susanna Forbes, known as Drink Britain from the UK, and her husband, James Forbes. They both have Little Pomona Cidery in the Hereford region of the UK. And I know I had spoke about this earlier. Yes, indeed, I got a recording from them, and I tasted their cider. And I just want to say, they are doing a certain niche that, was rather interesting. Um, we had one Keefe cider, and then the other cider knocked my socks off. A deep, rich, tannic cider, and something that I liken to of a level of cider making that is really unique. You could see that James comes from a winemaking background, or a, a wine aficionado background, and how he and Susanna, they blended this cider. This is one that can be aged, and I, I do believe it should be aged. And you'll hear us talking about it. And I don't see that kind of style of cider making around too often, but it is one to really keep an eye on. So you go, little Pomona. I am stoked to get that podcast out. There's a lot of podcasts, actually, because uh, that evening... I headed then on to pour the core, and by the time that was all done, I had a total of about 15 recordings, including some videotapes. So there's a lot in the queue now, all for you, Ciderville. And if you feel that this is worth your time, please, please, please become a patron of Cider Chat. And if that doesn't work for you, a donation is just as good, too. I am looking for sponsors of this podcast to help it keep on growing and allowing me to keep on producing these amazing conversations with makers from around the world, with people in the cider trade, and with cider enthusiasts just like you. When I come back, I'm going to tell you about the final voyage that we had before I headed back to my final spot in Ciderville. Oh, hey, Palms, I didn't know you were going to be on this episode. Well, of course we are going to be on this episode, Rhea. You're speaking about Perryville. In fact, I think this segment should be moved to the front of the podcast, don't you? Perry has been out in the orchard all week telling everyone about our trip to Perryville, Maryland. <laughs> it's true, Rhea. He's been talking about it even in his sleep. I now have to wear earplugs at night. That's not easy for a quince, you know. Oh, Mr. Quince, I, I can't even imagine. <laughs> Tell me about it. Well, you know, I was going to talk about it, but now that you're here, Perry Pear, I think you probably might be the best pair to be talking about it right now. Indeed. We set off to Perryville after being at CiderCon in Baltimore. It is one hour north of Baltimore, a very short drive, and along the sea coast. In fact, it's right off Interstate 95. Upon arriving to Perryville, you will see a large sign that says, Welcome to Perryville. In fact, you will see many signs that say Perryville Sportsman Bar, Perryville Town Hall, Perryville Police, Perryville written across an entire bridge in very large letters, mind you. Oh, these pears. I thought it was beautiful everywhere there was Perryville, but I didn't see too many pears, Perry. That is not the point of this story. The story is that Perryville was there. And for those of you out in Ciderville, you should know that there is a Perryville. 
And this, I suspect, is one of many Perryvilles. I do recommend that we all visit Perryvilles and document it as such. There'll be photos up on the show notes for this episode. Which number is that, Mr. Quince? <clears throat> this is episode 115, Perry. Baltimore Speaks Cider. Right. I think it probably should be saying Baltimore Speaks Cider and Perryville Speaks Pear. And on that note, Ciderville, we're going to roll on out of here. Thanks for listening. Next week, we'll be back with another podcast. And in the meantime, enjoy all the cider and perry that's out there. That's exactly what we're going to be going to do after this episode. You're right about that, Perry Pear. All right. What do you say? We take it out of here. Okay, Mr. Quince. Cue the music. Three, two, one. This is Real Wind Caller signing off for now. With a little bit of help from my friends, the Talking Palms, we wish you the best of days and hope to see you soon in Ciderville. Perhaps we should ask Perryville, Maryland, if they'd like to set up a Perry Museum. Oh, brother. That's a great idea, Perry. Okay, Palms, let's go and close up this shop. Come on, cue that yee-haw. We're out of here. Yee-haw!